we've already pretty much using history and scripture blasted away the single pillar of Catholicism, which is their claim to authority. And once you realize that the claim to authority is not biblical, the claim to authority is not historical, you realize that all the other doctrines that then they build on that claim don't have any claim over you. And it's very liberating. Many uh, former Catholics found it extremely liberating to be able to just open the Bible and just believe it and not add anything to it. Well, tonight what we're going to do is deal with um, false teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. Those things that came out of this belief. Um, I think we have some feedback. You hear that low? Ooh. You hear that? All right. Cool. Um, we're going to deal with some false teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. Things that come out of their, well, really out of their gospel. We've already explained how the gospel of Rome is a gospel of faith plus works. Well, once you add works to the gospel, it's natural to ask, which works? I mean, if you're going to tell me I have to be saved by faith plus works, then you're going to have to then tell me what works are going to save me. And that's what Rome has done. In fact, it's given quite a few. You may have heard of the seven sacraments. We're going to deal with that tonight and talk about those and understand them better. A sacrament is kind of a fancy word. In Catholicism, the word sacrament is a means of grace, or if I can put it, more in my own language, it's a way that you can earn grace. You do the sacrament and then you earn pieces of grace or little bits of grace. In Catholicism, grace is given out piecemeal, little by little, as you you go each time to mass or each time you do penance, that kind of thing. You get a little bit more grace each time. Um, You may have heard of indulgences. Raise your hand if you've heard of indulgences. And I'll bet you at least some of you thought, indulgences, Mike, that ended years and years ago, like in the Reformation, like they quit it. It's actually, that's not true. Catholicism has indulgences even today. Um, it, they've been used since the Reformation and on. And yeah, certain forms of indulgences were frowned upon after the Reformation because there was, there was certain guys that were saying, ah, every time a coin in the coffer rings a soul from Purgatory Springs. And there was this kind of extremely silly version of indulgences. But that, that's not quite what it's ha- what's happening anymore. And Catholicism has, in America, in the United States of America, has downplayed indulgences. But you have to understand something. If you have a gospel of grace plus works, well, the plus works part, that's the indulgences part. In- indulgences is essential to Catholicism. And it's, um, it's wrong to a believer in Christ to believe in such a thing. But it's necessary. Grace, again, is given out piecemeal. In fact, even the current Pope, Pope Francis, the new Pope, who the world is having kind of a romance with at the moment, at least some parts of the world, um, this guy recently did a tour where he said, hey, you'll get indulgences if you show up at, say, Rio de Janeiro or whatever location he was at. And then he did something no Pope has ever done before. He extended that offer of indulgences to those who would follow on Twitter. Not kidding. Now, not, not frivolously, they have to like heartfelt follow on Twitter. They have to really devotedly be involved in that sort of thing. And so his Twitter accounts, you know, in multiple languages were getting more and more followers because people are like, whoa, any chance to get indulgences you want because indulgences will cut down, cut down your time in purgatory. And that's, uh, yeah. Well, so, see, there you go. As soon as you add works to the gospel, it starts to get weird. It starts to get really strange and really confusing. So let's talk about these seven sacraments. The seven sacraments of the Catholic Church, seven means of grace, or seven ways in which you can get more grace into your life because you don't have enough with just uh, just Jesus. The first one is baptism. And that bit, baptism is generally going to take place at infancy. And you might be like, why do they baptize infants? I don't understand this. I thought, I thought it was a believer's baptism. Why do we baptize infants in the Catholic Church? And the reason is because of what they think baptism does. In Catholicism, baptism doesn't get rid of, uh, of all your sins. It gets rid of original sin. It gets rid of that Adam and Eve inherited sinfulness. So it's a very peculiar view of baptism. And that's why they're willing to baptize an infant. Because it's not getting rid of infant's sins. It's getting rid of the sins inherited through Adam and Eve on that infant. This is what a Catholic views as being born again, or at least in Catholic theology. When you get baptized, you are therefore born again. However, that doesn't make any change of your life or any change of the way you live or anything like that, as we would suggest as born-again Christians, born again is a a life transformation experience of Jesus Christ. It's more of a, um, just a declaration. 
Okay, you're baptized, you're born again. But, so baptism, baptism is, according to Vatican II, it is only a beginning, but it is necessary for salvation. So it's a step, but it's not the whole thing. It's just one of the things you've got to do. You've got to be baptized in the Catholic Church. The Catholic Encyclopedia says about baptism, it makes us Christians. It makes us Christians. Now, what does the Bible say about baptism? Well, I, we, don't, we don't have time to do a whole study on just baptism. It would take the whole night. So I'm just going to give you one passage. Acts chapter 8, verses 36 and 37. And the Bible here limits who will get baptized based on one concept. So let's, let's read about it. Philip is on the road. He meets this eunuch. He shares the, 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 the teachings of Isaiah 53 with him. The eunuch puts his faith in Christ, and then he wants to be baptized. And so we pick up in verse 36. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? That's a really good question. He's like, is there any reason why I shouldn't be baptized? Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And so this is what, where we get the phrase believer's baptism. Hey, can you be baptized? Well, do you believe? Is your faith and trust in Christ? Yeah, it is. Then let's, then let's do it. Is it not? Then let's not do it. Because this baptism symbolizes your faith and trust in Christ, your identification with his death and resurrection, turning from the world to follow Jesus in your life. And so if you're not, you know, having that position of faith, then it doesn't make any sense. It's kind of hypocritical to do a baptism then. So we believe in uh, believer's baptism. Now, there is one passage in the New Testament that talks about a man and his entire household getting uh, baptized. So his household got baptized. However, what the Catholic Church does with this is they say his whole household got baptized. That would include infants. But this assumes something, doesn't it? It assumes that his household included infants. Just by show of hands, does any of you, does your household include infants? Nobody in the room here right now. <laughs> uh, your average household doesn't have infants in it. So you shouldn't just assume that that's the case and build a whole doctrine off of the phrase, in his household, you know, got baptized. So there are actually scripture, um, scriptural examples and teachings that baptism is not what saves you, but something that comes as a result of salvation. In fact, it's allowed because they're saved. So one more example is Acts chapter 10, just a little bit further along. When Peter is talking with Cornelius, this centurion, and he preaches the gospel to him, and this man ends up uh, believing in Jesus, and then the Holy Spirit just falls upon them and enters them. And so obviously they're saved. When, you're, when the Holy Spirit is in you, New Testament, Holy Spirit filling you. You are Christian. You are saved. So Peter responds to seeing them filled with the Spirit in Acts 10, 47. And he says, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? See, baptism is like a total after-the-fact thing here. It's like, man, look. Whoa, they're, they're totally saved. God has saved them. God has, has embraced them with his love. He's washed them with Christ, filled them with the Spirit. Hey, we should probably let them get baptized, huh? <laughs> so he's, he's saying, ah, they don't need to be circumcised. They don't need to become Jewish. They just need the Holy Spirit. They just need to believe in Jesus. Let's get them baptized. So that's the view of baptism in, uh, in, uh, the, in the Bible versus Catholicism. The second sacrament, the second means of grace is called penance. P-E-N-A-N-C-E, -N -N -E, penance. Penance, you might think of this as going to confession. Going to confession, you go to a priest and you explain your, your sins, and this deals with two different kinds of sins, venial and mortal sins. Venial sins are the sins that you have to pay for, but you're still saved. But I've got to pay. I've got to pay for what I did here and there. And I've got to pay for it not only just in this life, but in the next life, in, in purgatory in that location. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. Mortal sins are sins which, if you commit, you actually lose grace and you lose your salvation at the moment you commit a mortal sin according to catholicism and then you go to the priest and you say hey you know bless me father for i have sinned it's been this long since my last confession i've committed venial sins this is them this is what they were this is how many times or i committed mortal sin this is the mortal sin here's how many times i did it da, da, da. and then uh, penance involves this you have to be contrite you have to have contrition or humility or you know sort of like a sorrow over sin you have to have confession to a priest it's got to be to a priest. Confession to someone else doesn't count. Um, only the church, according to Roman Catholicism, has the power to forgive. Only the church does. 
That's why you've got to go to the priest. Now, Jesus is my high priest I go directly to, but in Roman Catholicism, I, I, I have all these in-betweens. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a religion full of mediators. People get in between you and Jesus. <laughs> and so you go to this guy and you confess your sins, and here's the theology in Rome. I'm just going to summarize it for you. In Roman teaching, there's something called the treasury of merit. And I want you to imagine, if you can, a giant bank vault full of good works. And the good works are Jesus' good works, Mary's good works, and then thirdly, the works of this, the good works of the saints. Not of all Christians, just specifically the, like the canonized saints. Their good works. And that's like locked up and secured. And the only way to access this treasury of merit is through the keys that the Catholic Church has, the keys of the kingdom in Matthew 16. So I go to the priest and I say, here, I've sinned, I've done this, I've done this. And he officially reaches up with the keys, opens the, opens the, the vault, takes some of the good works out of Jesus, Mary, and the saints, and he applies some of it to me to bring me back into a state of grace. And then he just tells me my part. My part is the confession and then the penance. Now the third, so contrition over sin, confession, and the third part is following the instructions of the priest. Following the instructions of the priest. Typically this involves praying like 10 Our Fathers or 10 Hail Marys. Um, praying the rosary is a work. It merits grace. Praying the rosary every day is going to try to help keep you out of purgatory. Uh, sometimes this requires a religious pilgrimage to a shrine of Christ or Mary or wearing painful clothing. I have a feeling that the, the things the priest requires in the United States are a lot easier than the things the priest require. If you go down to South America, I think they're probably more strict and ask for more just because we're more of an individualistic and lazy culture. So, <laughs> so they don't want to put too much on us, I guess. Um, but what's interesting is the priest, if, you, if you've ever been to a confessional, then the priest has a purple stole that he wears that, I don't know if you know this, that is meant to signify his authority, purple being the color of royalty. And he has this purple stole to say, I, am, I have the authority to forgive your sins. See, going to a priest is not about, hey, pastor, will you pray for me? Hey, I need to talk to somebody. I've got some struggles going on. I need some fellowship. I need some, some advice, some counsel. I do counseling all the time. But that's not what this is about. This is not about counseling, although I'm sure at times it turns into a counseling session. This is about getting your sins forgiven through the one and only source, the Catholic Church, where sins can be forgiven. Through this treasury of merit that only they have the keys to. So if your mortal sins have been committed, you get sort of, you get brought back, you get saved again when you, when you do this confession. And if it's venial sins, then those get washed away. So that hopefully, like, let's say that you walk right out of you know, the, uh, the confessional, and you've done the things the priest have told you to do, and then bam, you get hit by an airplane or something, I don't know, whatever, right? <laughs> you know, you, 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 you fall into like a lava pit or something, and you die right away. Hopefully, you're just going to go straight to heaven and skip purgatory. But then if you wait till later that day, you may have committed some venial sins, or possibly even a mortal sin, in which case you've, you've, you've lost your salvation if it's a mortal sin. So there's a problem with this. In fact, there's several that probably have already occurred to you. In fact, in fact, for Bible-believing Christians, just hearing the theology of the Catholic Church is enough to get you to go, yeah, that's just, wow, that's weird. That's so not what I read in the Bible. There is no Roman Catholic priesthood in the Bible. It just doesn't exist. You never see people in the book of Acts going to a priest and confessing their sins. We are all priests, according to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 5 and verse 9. We're all priests, every one of us. There is one particular verse that I hear used by Catholic theologians to promote the idea of having to go to a priest to get forgiven. And it's James 5, 16. I'd like to read it to you. It says, Confess your trespasses to one another, and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now, you can push the priesthood onto this, but it's like, it's like a square peg in a round hole. It's, this is not about the priesthood. Confessing my trespasses one to another. Just open up and talk to each other. Any of you confessing to any of you fulfills this. Not a priesthood. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. It's talking about body ministry where we're all priests in the kingdom of God and we all have the ability to minister to each other, pray for each other. Your prayers are as powerful as mine or as powerful as anybody else's. 
when, when they thought, oh, we don't have enough faith, Lord, that's when he told them, oh, all you need is a mustard seed. I like the old song, it says, you don't have to have a lot, just use what you got. <laughs> and it's, you know, Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. Your prayers are powerful because the one you pray to is powerful. So this, think about this, like if you were just studying the Bible and you were rebuilding Christian doctrine, you were stranded on an island and you, you knew nothing of Christ except what the Bible taught, would you ever come up with the Roman Catholic priesthood? Or do you read James 5.16? Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effect of fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Obviously, this means we'll have to get purple stoles. you got to get like a little box that you go into and then you have to say what you've done to the priest. And if it's a venial sin, then, you know, that'll get dealt with as a mortal sin. You'll get saved again. And then I mean, you never would come up with this stuff. This is clearly extra biblical. According to the book of Hebrews, and I strongly encourage reading it if, if this is a challenging concept for you at all, Hebrews, we go straight to God through Jesus. That's end of story. We go straight to God through Jesus. Do not let anyone get between you and God. Because there is no one between you and God. So anyone who tries to squeeze in there is an imposter. Now the third, <clears throat> the third uh, sacrament, the third way of getting grace, is known as Mass. M-A-S-S. -S, mass. Mass involves the re-presenting of the sacrifice of Jesus to the Father in order to appease God's wrath and cover people's sins. Mass, which you might think of as communion, is different. In fact, in the Catholic Church, it's called transubstantiation. And what you have to know about this is Mass is a means of grace. Remember, grace is given out piecemeal in the Catholic Church. Little by little, here's some grace, here's some grace, here's some grace, here's some grace. And you sin later, well, you need, more, you need to come back for more grace for that. So mass, this belief in transubstantiation, is where they say that the body and the blood of Christ are literally present in the cup and in the bread. And here's where they actually get into a little bit of physics. Uh, the Catholic theology actually has a little bit of a position on, on, on physics and how things work in reality. They say that there is the accidents and the substance of an object. The accidents is just what it looks like, but the substance is what it actually is. And their belief is that when the priest, and you have to have the priest to do this, when he holds up the host and he holds up the bread and the cup and he says the special prayer ritual, what happens is this bread physically transforms into the actual physical body of Jesus Christ. It is now human flesh. And that the cup actually transforms into the physical blood of Jesus Christ. It is actually human blood. This is at the center of Catholicism. This is the most important, probably, of all of the sacraments, is Mass. It is constantly, constantly, constantly done. So, substance versus accidents. That, that's the view. It only looks like bread and wine. It's actually flesh and blood. This, according to Catholicism, is necessary for salvation. You can't be saved without this. Why do you have to re-present Jesus? Because grace is doled out piece by piece, little by little, here, here a little, there a little, and that's the theology they have. That's not the scripture. We have grace that abounds. We are, we are washed and clean. <clears throat> so many Christian songs as we've been worshiping, you know, like even just today and the last several weeks as I've been doing this series, I, I keep singing a song thinking Roman Catholicism could never sing this song. They could never sing the song about, oh, Jesus, your grace is enough for me. They could never sing that because it's not. I need works. Now, notice this. This is not merely in remembrance. That's what Jesus said. Do this in remembrance of me. Those are the words he used when he talked about communion. But this, this is Jesus. Like, this is actually Jesus. You're holding Jesus in your hands. You're putting him in your mouth and you're eating him. This strikes believers as, as, as it shocks people, right? But what, here's what it's done. By elevating mass or also called the Eucharist, by elevating it to this like really like high level, at least how, that's how it's viewed, what they've done now is they've said, ah, now we can give you something no one else can. And so you're sort of tied to the Catholic Church. You have to have this mass experience. And this is why they worship the bread and the cup after they've done the ritual to turn it into the body and blood of Jesus. They'll put it in special locations. They'll march it around the town, to, you know, different uh, religious pilgrimages and things like this. And they will physically bow down and worship the host. 
because they think it's Jesus. This is as close as you've ever been to Jesus. He's right here. This, it just strikes you as like, whoa, <laughs> where did this come from? This sounds really strange, and, and it is very strange. And here's the problem. It evolved over time. I know that the Catholic Church claims that the church has always viewed you know, transubstantiation as being the way things are. It's always thought that Jesus is physically in, in the, represented in the actual you know, bread and wine that it actually turns to his body and blood. But it is simply not true. This evolved over time. It wasn't, in fact, for instance, until over a thousand years later, about a thousand years later, when all of a sudden they started worshiping the Eucharist and actually doing this in around 1000 AD. And they started to actually bow down and they started to put it in a special vessel. And then they put out these decrees that said, we're not going to give this to children anymore. We can't give it to children because they might spill the blood. In fact, we'll give the bread to the people, but we will not give the blood to the people because they might spill the blood. And it became this very worry and concern about the exaltation of the actual substances. You know, um, This stuff developed over time, and it totally forgets the Jewishness of the disciples of Christ. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? If the apostles seriously thought they were eating human flesh, do you think they would have eaten? No. What does the Bible say? It says specifically, do not drink blood. Do not partake of blood. In Acts chapter 15, they had a whole discussion about the issue of blood, and they reiterate, don't drink blood. And you don't hear them say, except, of course, the Eucharist. That's an exception to the rule. It's just, don't drink blood. Don't do this. The, the, the disciples were Jewish. But as the Catholic Church moved more and more away from the Jewish context, it was easier and easier for them to interpret the Bible through the lens of their own rituals instead of through the lens of what it actually is. Passover is where this came from, right? When we do our communion celebration, it is something we've inherited from Judaism. It was the Passover celebration representing them coming out of Egypt. And you know the story in Exodus, right? Beautiful story. Every single part of that meal was symbolic. They would eat bitter herbs, like horseradish and stuff, like nasty tasting herbs, to remind them of the bitterness of the bondage of being in Egypt. They would eat this lamb that had been burned, not boiled, burned, representing judgment. They would eat it because it had its blood spilled so that they would have be passed over and all this other stuff. They'd eat the bread, they'd take the cup, and everything was symbolic. Every aspect of it was symbolic. So Jesus, at that meal, we read about this in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's the meal where he says, hey, this cup, which had all sorts of other symbolic meaning, he then takes it and tells them what it's really all about. It's the new cup, or the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. This, this bread, this is my body broken for you. Do this in rem remembrance of me. I don't think that they understood him to mean that it was physical and they they would have at least had a discussion about it whoa hold on i mean how could peter later on when god gives him a vision and acts hey get up kill and eat there's like a pig and he's like get up and kill and eat and peter says oh lord i've never eaten or touched anything unclean well that wouldn't be true if he had had eaten blood and had human flesh i mean this is it's not a clear teaching of scripture it's just a clear teaching of catholic theology there is one passage in particular that they like to use, and it is um, in John chapter 6. Now, you might be familiar with John 6. This is the passage where Jesus says, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you know, you will not, you will not see the kingdom and all this. And he says it seriously, really like, whoa, he seems really intense. But what I want us to know is this. The bookmarks, the beginning of the passage and the end of the passage. You got to read the whole thing in context, right? The beginning and end help us to see that he does not mean I'm literally going to make you eat my flesh and blood. So in John chapter 6, verse 35, beginning the discussion, he says this. And Jesus said to them, I'm the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. He who comes to me shall never hunger. Yet how many times is the mass provided? You could, as a, as a Catholic, as a good Catholic, you could get the mass and eat the Eucharist a thousand times. Easy. 5,000 times easy over the course of your life. You're constantly needing it again. It was, at least for a long time in the Catholic Church, it's been considered a mortal sin not to go 
and experience mass to skip out on it. <laughs> You got to do this. You got to do this. Not only will you not have your sins covered, you'll actually be incurring more sin upon yourself. But he says, you'll never hunger, never thirst. This implies that it's symbolic. I'm the bread of life. He comes to me, he's never going to hunger. It, it's not physical bread here. He's talking about spiritually speaking. I'm the bread of life. This is consistent with all of the, all that Jesus says in John. In John, in chapter 3, he says to Nicodemus, you got to be born again. He's speaking of a spiritual birth, not a physical birth. And he has this long thing where he tries to get Nicodemus to realize it's a spiritual thing. In John 4, he tells the woman at the well, I'll give you living water. And she's like, oh, good. Tell, give me this water so I don't have to come back here and fill up my bucket all the time. And he goes, no, I'm, I'm talking about spiritual truths. You know, he's trying to explain to her. And here in John 6, he says he's the bread of life. And you come to him and he'll, you'll never hunger and you'll never thirst. It's all spiritual truths. And the end of the passage, John chapter 6, verse 63, he reiterates this in case you thought he was speaking purely literally. It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. And this is in context of this. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Why, Jesus, should I take your words as being spiritual and not just purely physical? Well, the words that he speaks are spirit and they are life. He's talking about spiritual truths. Now, spiritual truths aren't less than physical truths. In fact, they're elevated as something more important because they're eternal. But yeah. Now, notice this. The Catholic view of the Eucharist, um, which we could easily spend, you know, ridiculous amounts of time on it, but I just want to give an overview of it. The Catholic view of the Eucharist, it is not just about what the bread and wine become. It's about what the bread and wine do. So they become the body and blood of Jesus when the, the priest, it's got to be the priest, and he says certain ritualistic prayers, and then wham, like magic, and it is like magic, it's like an invocation of, of like witchcraft almost, I mean, there's just similarities, and then it becomes this like body and blood of Christ. Well, that's what it becomes, but what it does is it brings the sacrifice of Jesus a sort of it's, they're really kind of squirrely in the way they word it, but it's, they don't like the phrase re-sacrificing Christ, although some have used that phrase. They prefer the phrase re-presenting the sacrifice of Jesus. Jesus is presented for you all over again because since your last Eucharist, Jesus had only paid for the sins you already did. But since then till now, you've sinned more. And so now we're going to pay for this. He's going to pay for the sins that you did again at least some of them, because it's not entirely clean and pure. They apply the grace of Jesus Christ, little by little by little, which sort of keeps you constantly going back to Mother Church for a constant need for constant grace, because you are constantly condemned. Hebrews 10, in fact, if you would flip there, I'll give you guys a second. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11 through 14, we're going to look at what the scripture says, because Hebrews blows the doctrine of grace piece by piece right out of the water. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11. And every priest, speaking of the Old Testament system, stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same offerings which can never take away sins. But this man, after he'd offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. So the biblical view is this, that you, yes, sanctification is an ongoing process, that's my character transformation, but the forgiveness of my sins... That was taken care of one time by one offering. He's perfected me forever. Can I say that again? He's perfected me forever. When I came to know this, it blew me away. My Christian life, before I was studying the scriptures more, reading the Bible and just understanding that Jesus paid it all, before I got that, I would sin and feel so beat up and I would go to the Lord and I felt like I needed the Holy Spirit to sort of remind me that God still loved me to kind of affirm that he's still there for me, that I'm not lost. And as I studied, I read Ephesians, and I read Galatians, and I read Hebrews, and I'm like, hey, he paid it all. He made a one-time payment for all sin. I hadn't done any of it yet, but it was already paid for. This is a huge blessing, and man, it's a weight of guilt off my shoulders, but not in Catholicism. 
Jesus' sacrifice is brought to the altar over and over again. And it is a continual reminder of the fact that your sins are not fully paid for. And this is ironic because it's exactly what the Old Testament system was. And it was a lacking system, which is why Jesus had to come and fulfill it. Hebrews goes into this, right? Every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. If I hadn't told you this was about the, the Old Testament system, you might have thought this was about Catholic priests. They stand daily, repeatedly offering the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. That's the idea. But this man, Jesus, had offered one sacrifice for sins forever. It's a once and for all. I like that phrase. It's in scripture. Sometimes you you should Google the Bible, the phrase once for all, and just see the things that pop up. Because Jesus paid it all. Once. One sacrifice. For all. Period. In Roman Catholicism, you can take in the blood of Jesus thousands of times and still go to hell. This is the teaching of this church, which is out of works to grace, and it's so sad. I can approach the offering of Jesus a thousand times, yet after the thousandth time, I commit a mortal sin. What mortal sin? Maybe, maybe just lust. And then I die and I go to hell. Because mortal sin takes away saving grace from your life. It undoes the baptism and undoes everything. This is not the gospel of good news. This is sad. And I feel feel bad for those who've been uh, given it. Well, this is the center of Catholic services because they're paying for sins again and again and again and again. And that's why a Catholic uh, gathering is, is a ritual experience. It's not like this where we're going to get edified and learn what the Bible teaches and learn about God and just worship the Lord. Rather, I come to church for a purpose. I come here to get freshly cleansed and then I go away. Then I come back to get freshly cleansed. And this has led, unfortunately, to many Catholics who party Saturday night and then they go to they go to Mass Sunday morning, you know, and they're like, oh, I'm getting my fresh forgiveness. And then they go off and they do the thing. They come out, getting my fresh forgiveness. And then they're thinking, I've got my pedigree, man. I got my, my sacrament. I got baptism. I got my confirmation. I got this. So I, hey, man, I know I'm going to purgatory for a while, but at least I'll make it. Because they really think works will save them. Well, the, the fourth sacrament is called Confirmation. And uh, this occurs when a bishop, a kid comes, you know, coming of age, and the bishop lays his hands on the head of the Catholic, signifying that they are coming of age. And that's considered one of the sacraments. Um, Do you have to do confirmation in order to be saved? No, but it's a means of grace. Number five, the fifth one is matrimony, marriage. It is a big deal if you're Catholic to have a Catholic wedding because it is a sacrament. It is a means of grace. You're trying to... You basically are trying to appease the wrath of God through these things. The sixth one is holy orders. Holy orders is kind of a confusing sacrament because you're like, how does, how do I do this? What are holy orders? Well, this is the priests, the bishop, the deacons, the offices in the church. in, In Catholicism, there's a strong difference between what they call the clergy and the laity. Laity is a fancy word for people. The normal people and the clergy or the, the official like, we're the, we're the servants, you know, of God. Whereas in Christianity, we say, hey, we've all got gifts of the Spirit. Mine happens to be teaching. Yours is different, but this, we're all on the same plane. I mean, we're all just, we're all believers. We're all disciples of Jesus Christ. Well, um, how do you do the sacrament of holy orders? Well, you don't do it. You just need it to be done for you. You need these guys. Like, if I don't have a priest to invoke the body and blood of Jesus, then I don't get the Eucharist. If I don't have a priest to do confession and give me penance, then I'm not going to be able to have the sacrament of penance. So that's why you need holy orders. It enables all these other things. And this is where the Catholic Church has, has come along and said, hey, apart from the Catholic Church, no one can be saved. In fact, I'll, I'll read to you some, some uh, statements. Pope Innocent III, in 1208 AD, he said, With our hearts we believe, and with our lips we confess, but one church not that of the heretics, but the holy Roman Catholic and apostolic church outside which we believe that no one is saved. Pope Pius IX in 1854, after Vatican I, said this, It must be held by faith that outside the apostolic Roman church, no one can be saved. And uh, 
that it's the only Ark of Salvation, and if you don't enter in, then you're going to perish in the flood. And it goes on. Even in 1965, though, something very different happened. Vatican II happened, the new council, with sort of a new twist and spin on doctrine. And you and me, evangelical believers, were upgraded from anathematized heretics to separated brethren. So that's nice. I've been, we've been given, like, upgrade. You know, you got to upgrade. We're just separated brethren now. And there is now a shift in the Catholic Church. Unfortunately, um, while uh, Pope Paul VI, you guys remember him, he was the Pope for most of our lives. Pope Paul VI, he delivered a message and elevated us to being separated brethren. Unfortunately, he also said Muslims worshipped the one true God along with Buddhists. And he made other kind of strange pronouncements without actually defining what they meant or answering any questions about what they meant. So it was like, are you saying the Buddhists are saved? Like they can be, oh, and just floated away and didn't really tell anybody what that meant. So this is the new um, direction of the Catholic Church. Remember, Catholicism is changing, changing, changing. Well, it changes with the times. And right now, under Pope Francis, the newest pope, Catholicism is getting more and more what's called ecumenical. Or the idea here is to, to um, rather than go, us four and no more, like, let's tighten up our reins. We're the Catholics. That was the last pope, actually. Pope um, Benedict XVI, I think it was. And he was Bishop Ratzinger before he became pope. And he retired very shortly after becoming the pope. He was actually a theologian, and he was kind of like shoring up, hey, no, this is what we believe. This is what Catholicism is. But then he retired, and Pope Francis came in. And Pope Francis, he's not really into theology that much. He's like, just throws open his arms, and someone says something about atheists, and he goes, eh, who am I to judge? And like never in the history of the Catholic Church has a pope said, who am I to judge? Because that's kind of what it means to be pope, right? <laughs> and so people are, but he's not explaining his statements. He just makes these statements. He's really trying hard to bring Protestants back into the Catholic Church. Uh, pope Francis has declared recently, the Reformation is over. <laughs> so the Reformation's over. The, the Protestantism is unnecessary. And, and he's, he's really reaching out. He's actually making some Catholic theologians very upset. He's reaching out and, and doing things like he just recently named a building um, in, in Rome after Martin Luther. This just happened. And in 2017, him and some other people are supposedly, we'll see if this happens, going to sign an agreement that says that they all have basically the same gospel. Which we know, after you've gone through this series, that we don't. We don't have the same gospel. So it's basically, a, it's built on a lie. Um, now, I hope that we can have the same gospel, but they need to come out and say, ah, forget all this. Here's the gospel. Jesus saves. I mean, they need to come out and just make it about Jesus, and then we can say we have the same gospel. And that would be awesome. That would be awesome, because I think the church could be changed, and it could experience radical change. But Pope Francis is trying to bring everybody in, ignoring the differences rather than fixing them. And that's the problem with the ecumenical movement is we pretend we agree when we really don't, when we really don't. And, um, and according to Jesus, this gospel is an essential issue, and we can't pretend to agree if, if we don't. So that's holy orders. Uh, the seventh and final of these seven sacraments is the anointing of the sick or of the dying, or you may have heard the phrase, last rites, giving someone their last rites. This is to resolve mortal sins and hopefully to help them avoid purgatory, or at least avoid as much purgatory. So someone's dying, the priest comes in, and they're just like, hey, man, you could get me maybe years cut off my purgatory sentence, do a ritual over me, and then um, that, that's the last one, another means of grace. Now, speaking of, of this, I think this leads us to a natural discussion of what on earth is purgatory? I mean, where does this come from? And I'm not going to get into great detail, but I just want to survey the differences, right? Purgatory is basically, let me describe it to you in my words, it's better than hell and worse than heaven. It's not good because you suffer there. You're suffering, you're in pain, you're in difficulty, you're, you're, you're sort of burning off your sins. Whether it's literal, literal fire or not, they debate that, I'm not going to even get into it. Um, I think if you were a Catholic 200 years ago, you'd be absolutely, it's literal fire. If you're a Catholic from the last 20 years, you might be like, no, it's just a purification. Um, because it, they're just getting softer and softer on these issues. But, but anyway, it's, it's a suffering for your sins. It is another result of having a gospel of works to get saved. Because what if you're like you're you're saved-ish, you know, <laughs> you're 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 saved, but you're not quite good enough to get to heaven? What happens? You go to purgatory. This is why, if you've ever been to a Catholic funeral, as I've been to many, they say, 
Let us assist them with our prayers. Speaking of the deceased. Let us assist them with our prayers. This, let me translate for you. They're in purgatory, and we would like them to get out quicker. So we're going to have a ritual where we all say prayers as sort of a way of appealing to that, that, that treasury of merit to try to cover some of their sins to get them out of purgatory quicker. That's the idea. This is why they do mass for the dead. Usually if a Catholic dies, they want them, people to do a mass for them after they've died. This is to try to help them get out of purgatory quicker. This grants something called indulgences. In fact, all these things are indulgences. Indulgences are just ways of getting grace through doing good things that the Catholic Church likes, whether it's giving money or Twitter following or whatever it is. You know. The souls of believers who have died will suffer for a time of purging that is supposed to prepare them to enter heaven. That's the idea. You are not ready. You have to be cleansed still. The old Roman Catholic view, this is pain, this is suffering, this is punishment, it's fire, it's like, you know, terrible. And then the, 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 the newer view, and this is not the theology of the church, this is just the newer view a lot of some Catholic theologians are saying, is that it's more like just a cleansing and a purification, and is it, is it painful, is it physical suffering, like, yeah, maybe, maybe not. You know, they kind of try to pull away from it. But the statements of the old Catholic theology are pretty harsh about what purgatory is. Now, what verse do they use to support purgatory? Well, turn to Ephesians chapter 5. This is one of the verses they use to support purgatory. I'll give you one other one after this. Ephesians 5.26. Here's purgatory in the Bible. That he may sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Oh, excuse me, verse 27. That he may present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So then it goes, oh, doesn't Jesus want us to be holy and without blemish? Are you holy and without, are you really ready for heaven? Are you ready to be in the presence of God? And so he needs to cleanse you and sanctify you. Yet, that ignores verse 26 that says that this happens by the washing of the water by the word. That this sanctification is not purified paying for my sins. It's just me growing in Christ. It happens through the scriptures. It happens through the ministry of God's word. It's happening right now. This is sanctification. It's a washing. It's not a burning. There's a difference. The other passage they use is 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to read through and talk about the whole passage, but basically this is talking about the Bema seat or the judgment seat of Christ that believers will face. And that each one of us, our work will be tested to see what kind of work it was. Did I really labor with like wood, hay, straw, stubble, or gold, or precious things? And then the work will be tested. The reason why this is not purgatory is because believers aren't judged. Their works are judged. It's a one-time analysis. It is not an ongoing process. And the purpose is reward, not, not this burning my character, bad character qualities out. And the statement, as through fire, is in the passage. He himself will be saved, yet as through fire... Yet, can I say this? It didn't say, he himself will be saved through fire. That's why it says, as through fire. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a simile, a like or as, not an actually is type thing. Um, but you would never read this and come up with the doctrine of purgatory. You would just come up with the idea that, that all the things I've done for Christ in order to receive reward, well, God's going to cast off the stuff that I did that was not really for Christ or that was not done with right heart or right ways. And I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I don't want to, I don't want to carry that stuff with me. I'm glad that that'll be gone. But that's not a burning of myself to cleanse my character. Um, purgatory is, you can't get around it. It's punishment. And that is why someone else can have a mass and have the sacrifice of Jesus to try to cover your sins so you can get out of purgatory quicker. Because it's punishment. Evangelicals, we believe that the doctrine of purgatory is man-made. It's an invention that denies the sufficiency of what Christ did on the cross. Because the Bible teaches that Christians are immediately upon death in the presence of God. 2 Corinthians 5.8, it says that for us to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Oh, that's good news. There is no third location. Philippians 1, 21 through 23, Paul talks about his desire to depart and be with Christ. He's like, oh, I want to depart and be with Christ. Because to live is Christ, but to die is gain. But to be honest, purgatory sounds a lot worse than living here on this earth. It wouldn't be gain. 
No, to be with Christ. Jude 24 says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. That's my future. Hebrews 10, 14. I'll read this again. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. If ever there was a person in the Bible that deserved to go to purgatory, if there was such a place, it would have been the thief on the cross next to Jesus. It would have been this guy, right? I mean, he's a dirtbag, okay? He admits on the cross, I deserve to be here. This is not humility. This is him telling the truth. (laughs) I deserve to be here on this cross. So what does it take that you're like, that's how bad I am. I deserve to be here. Jesus says to him, truly I say to you, today you shall be with, with me after a brief time in purgatory. No, he says, in paradise. You'll be with me today in paradise, Luke 23, 43. He had just believed. He had no time to do a single good work before he breathed his last. He didn't get baptized. He didn't get confirmation. He didn't have confession. He didn't do any of these things in the Catholic Church. He just simply believed in Christ. And he was with Jesus in paradise that day. No no room for purgatory in the Bible. No room for purgatory. The word purgatory doesn't appear in the Bible even once. It just doesn't exist. Even though a lot of details are given about heaven and final states and we know about transitionary periods and all this kind of stuff, nothing about purgatory because it's not biblical. So I want to move forward to another issue, which is praying to the dead for the dead. Um, uh, Both of those, praying to the, the dead saints and praying also for them. Well, first, let's talk about what a saint is. In Catholicism, a saint is simply this. Because people don't know this. They're like, oh, they've been sainted. What does that mean? They're really holy? Well, yeah, but there's more. It means the Catholic Church is saying, this person is no longer in purgatory. They are actually in heaven. So the saint, the list of saints are the people that are say, we guarantee these ones are actually in heaven. That's interesting, right? A lot of people don't know that. These people actually in heaven now, they have obviously paid enough for their own sins along with the blood of Jesus. And now you can appeal to them for some of their good works to be for you. So they've got more than enough good works for their own salvation and for helping you as well. They have special access to God and they can hear you and they can help you in your prayers. Now, this is opposite of the biblical view that all of us are saints. And Roman Catholicism agrees. It says, oh yeah, everyone's a saint, but these are saints. And it basically invents a new category of saint that doesn't fit with the scripture at all. So first let's consider praying for the dead to get them out of purgatory. This let us assist them with our prayers. The Catholic Church teaches that Christians who are alive on earth can come to the assistance of souls in purgatory by intercessory prayers, by almsgiving, giving to the poor, giving to the church, and by other pious works, like, say, doing a pilgrimage and crawling on your knees up this altar. This is actually something uh, Martin Luther did. He was crawling on the knees up an altar. He would pray the rosary, then he'd crawl up one other step, and then pray the rosary, crawl up another step, and pray the rosary. And that was where he was like, this is insane. You know, and he, just, he just, like, dropped it and left because he just realizes, like, uh, he was trying to get, I think it was his uncle, maybe trying to get him out of purgatory. That was his goal. And you can see, like, this is just so not the gospel of the grace of Christ. Evangelicals, biblical Christians, reject this on the basis that there's no biblical support for it in any way, shape, or form. There is not one example of people praying for the dead in the Bible. It doesn't happen. But you would think that this would happen. Like, Stephen dies, and they're like, hey guys, let's have a mass service for him in in Acts chapter 7. But no, this never happens. I think that that's enough reason right there to not do it along with every other statement in the scripture. So so here we are, um, praying to Mary and the saints. That's praying for the dead. There's just no reason to. (laughs) Let's put it that way. Now praying to Mary and the saints, this is a little different. Now I'm I'm not praying that my prayers will help them. I want their prayers to help me. You see the difference? The Catholic catechism, catechism says this, catechism, excuse me. The witnesses who have preceded us into the kingdom 
especially those whom the church recognizes as saints, because they're in heaven, share in the living tradition of prayer by the example of their lives. They contemplate God, praise him, and constantly care for those whom they've left on earth. Their intercession is their most exalted service to God's plan. We can and should ask them, the saints, to intercede for us and for the whole world. We should be talking to dead people to seek for them to talk to, uh, to talk to God on our behalf. So the church encourages its followers to pray things like this. Here is a very normal uh, Catholic prayer. This is things that popes pray and priests pray and the Catholic people pray. It's called the prayer of the perpetual, the mother of perpetual help prayer. I'll read it to you. It's to Mary. O mother of perpetual help, thou art the dispenser of all the gifts which God grants to us miserable sinners. She is. And for this end, he has made thee so powerful, so rich, and so bountiful, in order that thou mayest help us in our misery. Thou art the advocate of the most wretched and abandoned sinners who have recourse to thee. Of course, at the advocate is Jesus Christ the righteous, according to John. We have an advocate, Jesus. But here it's Mary's the advocate. Come to my aid, for I recommend myself to thee. Into thy hands I place my eternal salvation. And to thee I entrust my soul. To Mary. Count me among thy most devoted servants. Take me under thy protection and it is enough for me. For, now check out what Mary can do for you. There's three things. If thou protect me, I fear nothing. Not from my sins, because thou wilt, thou wilt obtain for me the pardon of them. Mary will get you pardoned for your sins nor from the devils, because thou art more powerful than all hell together, Mary. Huh? Nor even from Jesus. That's right. Mary will protect you from Jesus. This is this prayer. My judge, because by one prayer from thee, he will be appeased. Jesus is like, oh, Geneva, I'm going to get you. I know what you've done. And you're like, Mary, help. And she goes, Jesus, now come on. And he goes, okay, mom. And now he doesn't get you. This is insane. This is not biblical. This is so crazy. I think Mary would be a, just shocked by this kind of stuff. She was a godly, wonderful woman. She would never let this take place if she had the power to stop it. Just like the apostles, when they bowed down to worship them, and they said, whoa, stop right there. You know, this, is, this is wrong. You know, She would say the same thing. But here, let me go on. I'll read the rest of it. But one thing I fear that in the hour of my of temptation, I may through negligence fail to call on thee and thus perish miserably. Obtain for me, therefore, the pardon of my sins, love for Jesus, final perseverance, and the grace ever to have recourse to thee, O mother of perpetual help. Catholics are encouraged by the Roman Catholic Church to pray prayers like this, not to God, but to Mary. I read this and I gasp. This is absolutely contradicted by the Bible, which says in Philippians 4, 6, can I read this to you? Let your requests be made known to who? God. Prayer is always, always, always to God. Never, ever, ever to anyone else. Always to God. Jesus taught us to pray, our Mary who art in heaven. No, our Father who art in heaven. That's how he taught us to pray. The Apostle Paul writes, there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 2.5. That Jesus is the go-between. He's God the man. So, I mean, I just go to God to get to God. This is what I do. I am connected to the Lord. I don't go to Mary to get help with him. There's really a belief firmly entrenched in the heart of so many Catholics that Mary loves you more than Jesus. Mary cares more about you than Jesus. Mary is more compassionate to you than Jesus. And can I say... That's not because you overestimate Mary's compassion. It's because you underestimate Jesus' compassion. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. If it was Catholic theology, it would say Mary so loved the world. Mary walked in obedience, but it was God's love. It was God's plan. There are prayers in the Bible from Genesis all the way to Revelation, and not one of them is addressed to a saint, an angel, or anyone other than God. In fact, numerous passages in the Old Testament tell us not to try to contact the dead. Deuteronomy 18, 
Leviticus 20, 1 Samuel 28, Isaiah chapter 8, all of them unanimously, it says things like this, like, why should the, the living contact the dead on behalf of the living? This doesn't make any sense. Shouldn't a people seek their Lord? And that's what happens is these, these, all these mediators, all these in-betweens, all this clutter getting between you and your relationship with God. Another thing that happens in Catholicism is the veneration of the saints. Um, making images, bowing physically to those images, lighting candles to those images, praying to those images, thanking those images. These are all the same things the Old Testament forbids people to do under the name of idolatry. But that's what the Catholic Church does. But what the Catholic Church says is, hey, you know what? When we make a, a, a picture or a statue to the saint and we carry it around the city and people are bowing before it and crying and they're throwing money at it or putting flowers on it or whatever, um, and, they're, and they're like, you know, wanting to touch it and kiss it, that's not worship. That's, not, that's what we call latria. Latria is worship. This is just dulia. And dulia is just veneration. The problem here is, though, that the Catholic Church is basically taking the identical thing as worship and giving it a new name so that they can't be accused of worshiping. So I've, like, watched full-on Catholic debates where the Catholic says, well, yeah, you know, we pray we pray to them and we and we bow and we and we say wonderful things about them and, and, you know, there's all this other stuff that's happening. But that's not worship. That's veneration. Yet, it's just worship by any other name. That's all it is. So um, anyway, we can we could stay on that topic forever, but I want to move forward and talk a little bit more about Mary in particular. The Catholic Church teaches that Mary was immaculately conceived. The immaculate conception of Mary, it's official dogma. There's four Marian dogmas in the Catholic Church. And this means she's preserved immaculate from all stain of original sin. That's what Pope Pius said. Well, here's what they mean by this. Mary, when she was born into the world, did not inherit original sin. She was born sinless. And then she lived a sinless life. Mary never sinned. The first sinless human was not Jesus. It was Mary. That's modern Catholic teaching. Wow. Well, can I say this? Only sinners need a savior, right? And if you need a savior, it's because you're a sinner. You need the savior, Jesus, because you're a sinner. Well, Mary herself said this. In Luke 146, when she heard about Jesus, she said, My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. This is not an insult to Mary. <laughs> she sinned. Probably less than me. <laughs> but she sinned. In Mark 10, 18, Jesus said, No one is good except God alone. Romans 3.10 says, There is no one righteous. No, not one. It would have here said, except, of course, for Mary. But that's not in there. Another one of the Marian dogmas is that she has the perpetual virginity of Mary, that she remained a virgin after the birth of Christ, both before, during, and after the birth of Jesus. She was always a virgin. But the Bible says, and I mean over and over and over again, that Jesus had brothers and sisters. I mean, like, let me read this to you. Matthew 1, 24 and 25. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son and called his name Jesus. Now, if the Bible taught the perpetual virginity of Mary, it would have said he never knew her. But their, their teaching is, no, they got married, but they never consummated the marriage, which is considered a wonderful thing in the scripture. It's a wonderful thing to consummate the marriage. This is a beautiful thing. This is, this is one of the great things of marriage. And 1 Corinthians 7 talks about how you're not supposed to stay celibate in marriage. That's not how it works. This is bad for marriage. You want to stay celibate? Stay single. <laughs> you know, do that. But don't get married and then stay celibate. Mark 13.55, Mark 6.3, John 2.12, John 7.3, John 7.5, Acts 1.14, 1 Corinthians 9.5, Galatians 1.19. Mark 12, 46 through 50, all mention Jesus' brothers or Jesus' brothers and sisters. And the, the statement from Catholic theologians is, well, those are his cousins. And that word could mean cousins. And it's true that the word could mean cousins, but only if the context indicates it means cousins. Let me read to you this context. Jesus' mother and brothers were standing outside wanting to speak with him in Matthew 12 verse 40, 46 through 50 and he's told Jesus your mother and brother your mother and brothers are outside wanting to speak to you 
And Jesus says, I'll tell you who my mother and brothers are. They're the ones who do the kingdom, work, do the works of God. And, da, da, da. and so is Jesus in his ears here thinking, oh, you mean my mother and my cousins are out there? The context is mother and brothers, mother and brothers, mother and brothers. These are, this is, of course, a, a familial, close relationship. Um, and so the perpetual virginity of Mary is something that actually comes uh, completely unbiblical, and it's a, it's a later development. Another Marian dogma is that she was bodily assumed into heaven. It's called the bodily assumption of Mary. And the belief here is that Mary, when her earthly life was over, she was simply taken up to heaven like Elijah. Just caught up to heaven. And this is a very new doctrine. I mean, 1950, we're talking, this is really new, this bodily assumption of Mary. Not that nobody believed it before that, but now it's official. Um, the first time it's really expressed was in the 5th and 6th century, the bodily assumption of Mary, in an apocryphal gospel, a document that was considered so bad, the, the leadership of the church at that time put it on the index of forbidden books. That's the first source we have talking about the bodily assumption of Mary. It's this apocryphal gospel, a, a, a false gospel. Um, another Marian dogma is that she plays a part of our salvation as a mediatrix with Christ. This is um, a title that the, the two popes ago that was given to her, mediatrix with Christ. She mediates too. We've already talked about that. There's only one mediator between man, man and God. And there's various different Catholic justifications for this. But the basic point is this. The Catholic Church tends to put emphasis on Mary way above emphasis on Jesus to the, sa to the point where the attention is no longer on the Savior. Mary, the mother of God, the mother of God, mother, like a mantra that's just repeated over and over again, exaltation of Mary, pictures of Mary with Jesus putting a crown on her head. And that she's the queen of heaven. That's another one of her titles. It just goes on and on. Uh, two popes ago, John Paul II, he was totally into Mariology. He was totally into Mary. He wrote a book that was called The Book of Mary. And in it, he, oh, I could read you the quotes, but let's just say he put... He put her above the earth. I mean, he, he says, I place the church and myself into the hands of Mary. When he died, he dedicated, in fact, I'll read it to you. I place this moment, referring to the moment of his death, in, in the hands of the mother of my master, totus tuos, which means um, totally yours to Mary. In the same eternal hands, I leave everything and everyone to whom I've been connected in my life and my vocation. In these hands, I leave above all the church and also my nation and all of humanity. He leaves them all to Mary. So she's, she's the inheritor of all things, according to him. The last pope, Pope Benedictus XVI, he said, when he, his first statement as pope, he said, I place the church and myself into the hands of Mary. That was his first statement as pope. The, the worship of Mary is clearly happening here. And even the current uh, pope, Pope Francis, he likes to call Mary the untire of knots. That's like his nickname for her. The one who unties all the knots. He wants to. Un he wants her to untie the the divisions that exist in Catholicism or Christianity. So everyone will come under the Catholic Church again. He says Mary brings us to God. He dedicated his pontificate to Mary. The very first place he went after becoming Pope. The moment he became Pope, he goes where to Saint Mary Major. This this uh, basically it's like a giant building with pictures of Mary and altar to Mary. And he bowed there before an altar to Mary and presented her with a bouquet of flowers and prayed to Mary for help. One of the cardinals was with him said this about the moment. It was a lovely moment of prayer to the Virgin. After offering her the bouquet of flowers, he stayed a while praying in silence. Then we all sang the Salve Regina. And can I, can I read for you what they sang? What did the Pope sing? Him and the cardinals that were with him, they sang this. Salve Regina means Hail Holy Queen. Hail Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. Who do these titles belong to? They don't belong to Mary. They belong to Jesus. He's my life. When Christ, who is our life, appears. Not Mary. To thee do we cry, poor banished children of Eve. To thee do we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. Then turn, most gracious advocate, thine eyes of mercy toward us and after this our exile show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb jesus O clement O loving O sweet virgin mary pray for us O holy mother of god that we may be worthy of the promises of christ this is idolatry this is nothing less than a massive example of idolatry that has happened 
I like what Pastor Chuck used to say about idols. He said, idols are usually used because people are lacking a relationship with God. And I think that's what's happening. I think that there's a host of idols in the Catholic Church because they're lacking a simple relationship with God. And that our, our, um, our answer is this. There is a host of unbiblical teachings in the Catholic Church that are a result specifically of their false gospel. That's why I spent so much time on that and on the authority of the church. Here's the authority of the church built on that is the false gospel. And from that branch out a host of works that you have to do to get saved or, or stay saved or get resaved or whatever. And so we, we hacked out the authority of the church with truth. <laughs> we hacked out that gospel with scripture. And then I think that all I have to do is tell you about all these works and they just kind of fall down on their own, don't they? It's like, this is just silly. I don't need this stuff, man. I just need Jesus. You can have all this world. Just give me Jesus. That's all I need. That's all I need. We need to just be biblical. This is the lesson that the church has learned and that the Jews learned over time. Stick to the text, guys. Do what the Bible declares and just stick to the text. So here's my encouragement as we close out this series on Catholicism. The Bible's our text. Jesus is our only Savior. But it is, of course, possible that you and me have unbiblical views we've just inherited through tradition or whatever. Let's just make sure that the Bible's our authority. Let's make sure that we let God be God and that we let him tell us where we're wrong, whatever that is, so that we can just be those who follow him. Because guaranteed, we inherit errors even from our own leaders. Guaranteed. But the Bible is secure from those errors. And we just trust the scriptures. What caused the Reformation? An imperfect movement, the Reformation, but still wonderful. Martin Luther ran out of other books and decided to start studying the Bible. <laughs> just be in the word. Be in the word. Be people of the word. Let the Bible correct you and rebuke you and just straight up tell you you're being dumb. Stop it. You know, <laughs> let this happen because this is what cleanses us. This is how he sanctifies us by the washing of the water of his word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, this, this truth of your scriptures that we can come before you right now. And we can say, Lord, um, we just believe the scriptures. We just believe your word. And it's as simple as that. We just have Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He finished it. Like he said on the cross, it is finished. Our salvation has been purchased. And there is no purgatory. And there's no list of good works we have to do. It's simply, this is the work of God. Believe on the one whom he has sent. And for that, we're so grateful, Lord. And we pray this, as we bring our hearts and our lives to you, we pray, help us to stay open to the scriptures even now, to change our ingrained behaviors or our attitudes or anything, Lord, whatever you want to do, we want to be sanctified. We want to be washed by the water of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. We will pray.